Good evening. It's September 26th, 2014. My name is Matthew Ogden, and I would like to welcome you to our live broadcast from LaRouchePack.com for our weekly Friday evening webcast. I'm joined in the studio tonight by Benjamin Denniston from the LaRouchePack scientific team, as well as Dennis Small from Executive Intelligence Review, who will be delivering remarks, delivering answers on behalf of Mr. LaRouche tonight. Uh, the three of us have been engaged in discussions over the course of the day with Mr. LaRouche, so the remarks that you hear tonight will reflect what Mr. LaRouche's thinking is. Now I'm going to begin with our first question tonight, which is our institutional question, which reads as follows. Mr. LaRouche, on Wednesday, the United States Security Council, by unanimous 15 to 0 vote, called on all UN member countries to crack down on terrorist financing and on the flow of foreign terrorist fighters into groups like the Islamic State. While the resolution did not contain specific mandatory measures, it was an Article 7 resolution binding, binding on all member states to halt the flow of fighters and money. You have been one of the leading voices demanding the declassification of the 28 pages from the original joint congressional 9-11 inquiry, dealing with Saudi funding of the hijackers. You have also identified the Anglo-Saudi nexus as key to the promotion of terrorism worldwide. How do you assess the significance of the UN Security Council action and what is your prescription for a genuine campaign to defeat the scourge of terrorism, which not only promotes violence, but promotes a dark age ideology that poses an even greater threat to mankind's future? And I'll ask Dennis to come to the podium to deliver Mr. LaRouche's response. Thank you and good evening. I think it's not unfair to say in this case that Mr. LaRouche delivered his response to this question uh, before it was issued. Uh, in point of fact, in a statement issued on September 25th, yesterday at 10.23 p.m., uh, which I will mention in a moment, uh, because in point of fact, what the UN Security Council resolution points to on the issue of terrorism, were it applied as it is written, the first places it would appropriately be applied to are the British Empire, the United Kingdom, and the Saudi Kingdom, who are the two principal sources of the financing, the ideology, and the promotion of all terrorist groups internationally, most particularly those which are, in the case of the uh, situation in Southwest Asia, the Islamic State the subject of attention of that resolution. The best single way to dry up terrorism would be to actually apply these resolutions to the United Kingdom and to Saudi Arabia and to then proceed, as Mr. LaRouche has demanded over and over again, and this is now getting some traction in Washington in a serious way, to make public the censored 28 pages of the congressional inquiry on 9-11 which has been blocked from public view, first by the Bush administration, then by the Obama administration, when which points to, as is now a well-known public fact, to the role of Saudi Arabia in particular in the 9-11 developments. The broader fact of the matter is that all such terrorism, including the current terrorism, which we are seeing the, the absolutely inhuman bestial beheadings and so on, which we're seeing in the case of ISIS or the Islamic State, are created groups, are ersatz groups that have been artificially manufactured by international financial and political interests directly connected to the British Empire. And these groups then feed on the conditions, the economic and the social conditions created by the collapse of that British Empire, in particular the devastating poverty, the even worse pessimism, which is far worse than poverty, which creates the conditions in which this kind of dark age mentality actually uh, is able to flourish. Now, the reason behind the launching of this, these terrorist operations by the British and with their Saudi sidekicks is because their empire is collapsing. It is completely at the end of the line. 
And what they are doing in an attempt, a desperate attempt, to save that collapsing empire, as Mr. LaRouche put it in discussions earlier today, they are also trying to stop the global alliance that is coming together to cancel their system, the British Empire system, and to replace it with a new one. We are talking about the process related to the Russian-Chinese discussions earlier this year between Xi Jinping and uh, Putin, then the role that was taken in the Fortaleza Brazil meeting by the BRICS summit, the follow-up discussions that have happened with countries that are not formally part of the BRICS, but which are now part of that momentum, which have shaken to the root the British Empire system and actually is posing an alternative to it, uh, which is the solution to this crisis which we're facing today. Now, what Mr. LaRouche said yesterday, and the reason that I say that he addressed this question even before it was actually uttered, is because Mr. LaRouche issued a statement in which he responded to the developments going on, including Eric Holder's resignation, with a far more profound and fundamental point than the day's events. The full statement is called, Lyndon LaRouche Launches Urgent Appeal to Preempt a Dictatorship. It's available on the LaRouche PAC site. But I just want to give you a flavor of some of the things that he was saying. Mr. LaRouche said, look, Obama and what he represents know they're finished. Therefore, they're looking for a dictatorship in the United States and beyond. That's what we have to deal with. Mr. LaRouche said, so what you're looking at is a J. Edgar Hoover type of process, but a fully fill filled out kind of dictatorship. That's what you're looking for, and that's what you've got to prevent. He then went on to say, we do have global forces which will be on our side in this, and therefore we must immediately take full action to link our forces with those of China, India, and so forth. And that's the only way you can deal with this thing. He said, that's what we're headed for. And when the American people are so aroused in their quanti qualities and quantities that they take action to prevent a dictatorship from being established in the United States, even in the very early future. He said, this is a plan for a globally extended tyranny. This is for a terrorist regime in global parts of the planet, including especially the United States. If we don't overthrow Obama now, we're going to get genocide inside the United States under a dictatorship. That's the situation. We have a limited period of time, that of lapsed time, in which to prevent a dictatorship of the worst kind inside and beyond the United States. We have very little time left to mobilize ourselves and to mobilize the minds of the citizens of our nation. Now, in elaborating on what the stakes are and how to approach this in discussions earlier today, Mr. LaRouche said, look, we in the United States have to uphold our side of the bargain. The Chinese, the Indians, the South Americans, and the others are moving forward. We have to uphold our side of the bargain. We can't be the weak link in this. We have to, jointly among us, outflank the enemy. What is happening now, coming from the BRICS nations and others, is that they are spinning the enemy around. And the developments this week at the United Nations General Assembly is a good demonstration of that, as we'll elaborate a bit further ahead. Otherwise, Mr. LaRouche said, the plan that the British Empire has it for the United States is to bring in a monster. The entire crew now in power will be replaced with something far, far worse. They will be dumped and we will be facing mass death, both from the political uh, conditions which they are creating, but most emphatically from the em economic consequences of the collapsing British Empire were it not to be replaced. So that is what we have to do. What we have to do, Mr. LaRouche says, is we have to gum up the works. And the starting point of gumming up the works for the British Empire is getting rid of Obama and getting rid of his sidekick, Boehner. So in a follow on to that, as part of the discussion we had with Mr. LaRouche earlier in the morning, he wanted to make sure that we highlight and emphasize the critical role of the 
LaRouche PAC policy committee organization in the United States. And he wanted it known that uh, the National Policy Committee of the LaRouche Political Action Committee had been in the Washington, D.C. area over the past week and held a series of strategizing sessions with Mr. LaRouche and with Helga Zepp LaRouche to define the needed policy orientation for the United States. And Mr. LaRouche wanted it known that the policy committee is now redeployed in their respective regions across the country to now act as a nationally unified force to address the situation that Dennis just uh, described to us. So Mr. LaRouche has said that this is the critical factor for the United States right now. Uh, the world is rapidly changing, uh, and we're going and is going in a completely new direction, which is underscored by uh, the statements from the United Nations, which we'll hear from in a few minutes, from the leaders of these BRICS nations, among others. But, as Dennis just said, there is a complete vacuum in the United States. And Mrs. Helga Zepp LaRouche has aptly used the phrase, the nation or the continent of the clueless in the United States with respect to the lack of understanding of the shifting world situation. So, again, Mr. LaRouche wanted to underscore, this time the role of the policy committee organization that he has created and he is working with is critical, and he wanted a few elements of this highlighted. Uh, he particular and pointed to the important role of the New York and New Jersey region, where policy committee, Di committee member Diane Sayer is playing a key role. And uh, right now they're in the middle of a major intervention in that region into the uh, environment around the UN General Assembly meeting. Uh, over the past week and over the next week, throughout the course of this two-week UN meeting in New York, they have been circulating Helga Zepp LaRouche's call for a new global security architecture as a major intervention into the entire situation. Mr. LaRouche earlier today also pointed to what he said is the very important role on the other side of the country of Washington State. And there we have policy committee member Dave Christie. And Mr. LaRouche a number of times emphasized the important orientation of this activity in the Northwest because of the orientation across the Pacific towards Asia. In Washington State, you're bordering Canada, taking you right towards Alaska and the Bering Strait, and this is a critical intervention into this whole trans-Pacific orientation. And lastly, Mr. LaRouche pointed to the Southwest. And in California and Texas in particular, these regions are suffering the brunt of this physical economic breakdown of the United States right now. With the current drought and the failure to develop the necessary water infrastructure, not just recently but over the past decades, this region is in total uh, in the verge of catastrophe right now. So this is going to be addressed tomorrow, Saturday, September 27th, in a joint live Internet town hall event held by Keisha Rogers, policy committee member from Texas, and Michael Steger, policy committee member from California. And this event will focus on Mr. LaRouche's emphasis on the situation in the Southwest, that there are no local solutions to the drought crisis in the region. There are no regional solutions to the drought crisis in the region. It will only be as part of a global shift and a global approach to mankind managing the world's water system that this situation can be solved. And he pointed to the role of Michael and Keisha in leading that fight there on this perspective. And this is in direct contrast to the insanity we're seeing otherwise from even ostensibly leading political figures in the region who have said uh, literally that they believe that the California's water crisis has to be solved only with California water. Now, I'm not sure where they think California water comes from. I don't know if they, they think it magically appears in the mountains and then is there or just it magically appears in the ground, but the reality is California water comes from the Pacific Ocean. It comes from the global system. In point of fact, a very large portion of California's water comes all the way down from the tropics and from the equatorial regions in thousands of kilometer long structures in the atmosphere that bring the water there. So there is no local solution 
but Mr. LaRouche has emphasized the only, the only real solution is, the real issue is doing what China is doing, is doing what India is doing, is doing what Egypt is doing. It's not about practical solutions, it's about realizing mankind's role as a creative force on this planet to intervene and develop and improve the conditions of the biosphere of the planet and of mankind. And that's what the issue is. And that's the only way the global, wa the Western water crisis is going to be solved. So that'll be taken up tomorrow by our two leading members of the policy committee in this live international address. And again, Mr. LaRouche wanted underscored that the, his policy committee organization is now playing a critical leadership role across the United States as a nationally unified organizing force in the United States. And tomorrow's event will be one part of that entire process. So. so again, we encourage you to tune in to this live broadcast that's uh, occurring tomorrow. Now, when we met with Mr. LaRouche earlier today, one of the other major aspects that he stressed was that we have to see the world as it really is, um, as opposed to what Ben referred to as the people who are living within the continent of the clueless. We have to understand what the responsibility that this reality implies for us is. And he stated that what we're, what we're currently seeing is the formation of a global alliance among certain forces, among leading nations, whose intent is simply to cancel the currently reigning imperial system on this planet and to replace it with something entirely different. Uh, and I think that what we saw this week at the United Nations in New York makes that very clear. Um, in the aftermath of the BRICS summit in July, you've seen not only these five nations, Brazil, Russia, India, China, and South Africa, which comprise that grouping, um, uh, beginning to coordinate their actions much, much more. In fact, it was just announced today that the BRICS had a foreign, foreign ministers meeting, which occurred on the sidelines of the United Nations today, and those five countries decided to form themselves into a unified group within the United Nations organization functioning in concert to define policy and to steer the agenda. Um, but on top of that, on top of these five BRICS countries, you've seen a radiating effect of this uh, into other countries, with other nations becoming much more emboldened and much more liberated in their capability and in their willingness to act. And what we saw this week really was a number of these countries deciding to use the United Nations General Assembly as a forum to deliver a thoroughgoing indictment of the reigning imperial system uh, and to assert the urgency of establishing an entirely new economic and strategic order for the planet. And I'd like to give just three examples of this, which I think really illustrates this point. Um, First of all, here's what the president of Brazil, Dilma Rousseff, had to say. Let me bring this quote up on the screen. She completely denounced the Obama-Blair policy of responsibility to protect as a pretext for disregarding the principle of national sovereignty. Um, and she called upon world leaders to, quote, use, uh, to recognize that, quote, the use of force is incapable of eliminating the profound causes of conflict, as we've seen in the cases of Syria, Iraq, Libya, Northern Africa, and Ukraine. She said, with each military intervention, we do not walk towards peace, but rather we witness the worsening of these conflicts. And she highlighted the case of Libya, where she said, the concept of responsibility to protect was used by NATO as a justification for a military intervention which went beyond the mandate granted by the UN Security Council to bomb the country, to arm militias, and to promote regime change. It was used to arm radical groups benefiting terrorism. It did not serve the Libyan people, 
which became subject on an incredible scale to chaos, resulting from conflict between militias, including torture, kidnapping, rapes, illegal imprisonment, and executions. She said, the country's economy deteriorated and thereby the material conditions of a people. It destabilized the region and the outflow of arms and mercenaries to the Sahel region. See how the same thing is happening now in different degrees in Syria and Iraq, she said. Uh, and then she went on to, uh, to uh, counterpose the Obama doctrine, the Blair doctrine, to the new system which is now emerging and developing out of the collaboration among the BRICS countries, which she said, quote, serves as a pole of stabilization for the world order, complementary to the old structures. These structures, as we see every day, are not sufficient to counter the threats which put vast regions of the planet at risk, if not the whole planet. And she continued saying, the fact that the BRICS is made up of diverse countries is not a weakness, but it is its meaning, the message itself which the BRICS brings to the world. Despite differences, we unceasingly cease to find a consensus on those matters which we can only resolve together. To think differently, always giving priority to binary or confrontationist thinking, is to ignore the lessons of history, especially those offered by the two world wars of the last century. So that was Dilma Rousseff, the president of Brazil. Um, second, take the speech that Cristina Fernandez de Kirchner, the president of Argentina, delivered at the UN General Assembly meeting, incidentally during a session that was chaired by Obama, who was seated two seats away from her the entire time while she gave this speech, and he was reported, reportedly giving a deer-in-the-headlights expression on his face the entire time. Um, but in her speech, Christina strongly implied that the Obama administration's actions over the recent years have been largely responsible for the growth of ISIS and other jihadi groups in the Middle East. Uh, and she said, this is a quote, we are living in a third world war, as the Pope says, not a conventional war of the 20th century, but now more targeted wars. What are, the mo what are the most affected tool effective tools to combat terrorism, she asked. And she pointed out that the current policy is merely one of permanent bloodshed, uh, whose victims are generally innocent civilians. And then she pointed out the irony that, just as in the case of Osama bin Laden, who was originally trained by the United States in the 1980s to be used in the war against Russia in Afghanistan, who then only turned around and attacked the United States after that war was over, now Obama is guilty of exactly the same folly, uh, the exact same crime. Celebrating the militants in Libya and Syria as freedom fighters one year to be used to overthrow Assad, and then turning around the next year to use these very same militants uh, who are now joining ISIS and uh, becoming the sworn enemies of the United States. Now, finally, the third case I want to just refer your attention to, which I think is extremely significant, is the speech that was delivered by the new president of Egypt, uh, Abdel Fattah al-Sisi, who stressed that the only way to actually solve the crisis in the Middle East and in North Africa is by, quote, building the nation state, as Egypt is doing with its second, Panama, uh, second Suez Canal project, which he emphasized is an expression of the essential human right for development, quote unquote. Uh, he also stressed that terrorism is not a sociological phenomenon, but as Dennis mentioned in the beginning of this webcast, is an organized force which is committed and used to destroy the nation state, to, con to destroy culture, and to destroy civilized society itself. So let me read just a short quote from President al-Sisi. He said, I stand before you today as one of the sons of Egypt, the cradle of human civilization. From this podium, I salute the great people of Egypt. Our aim is to build a new Egypt, a state that is determined to achieve growth, prosperity, and a promising future that meets the aspirations of its people. To attain that, 
Egypt began implementing an ambitious comprehensive program to spur development until 2030, he said. The new Suez Canal project is the gift of Egyptians to the world, a proof of the seriousness of our intent and of the resolve of the new Egypt to forge a better tomorrow for its children and its youth. This is why I invite you to participate in the new economic conference that will be held in Egypt next February to achieve development and build the future not only for Egypt, but for the whole region. Uh, he said, Egypt with its Arab identity and African roots is the cradle of Mediterranean civilization and the beacon of moderate Islam. An Egypt that aspires to resolve regional disputes and uphold the principles of justice and humanity in today's world. He concluded by saying, I am confident that the capacity of Egyptians to give is infinite. We have, an inherit we have inherited this gift from our ancestors. It shall remain ever generous, God willing. Long live Egypt. Long live the peace-loving peoples of the world. Long live the principles of humanity and the values of tolerance and coexistence. And just to note, the Suez Canal project, the second Suez Canal project is progressing along quite nicely. In fact, it's already more than 25% complete in the digging work to build the new canal. So I think if you take these three statements from Al-Sisi, from Kirchner, and from Rousseff, it's very clear what Mr. LaRouche uh, emphasized, that you're seeing a new global alliance of nations coming together who are not afraid to call out the Obama policy for exactly what it is, and who are now moving to liberate themselves from a dead imperial system. Uh, and I think what Rousseff said about the BRICS being a pole for stabilization of the New World Order uh, is very apropos, especially considering the recent statement that was published just this week by Helga Tseplerouche, which, uh, which is called We Need a New Inclusive World Security Architecture, which, as Ben mentioned, was distributed en masse to the United Nations in the area of the United Nations General Assembly to delegates and representatives of countless countries in New York City all this week. So, Dennis, uh, could you address this question and speak more about the content of Helga's appeal and what the significance is of what we're seeing in terms of these nations that are now coming together to, as Mr. LaRouche said, cancel this current imperial system. You're seeing an explosion of economic development. You're seeing an explosion of political organizing activity. You're seeing an explosion of opposition to this uh, method of approaching the terrorism question uh, that you see coming from the British and from Obama. But most important of all is you're seeing an explosion of optimism, of people who have a sense that they have suddenly regained the capability that they knew they had, but which had been denied them, to actually make history, which means to look into the future and to create a world in the image of man's creative potential. And you see this coming from what some people would consider the most unlikely quarters. It's, in many cases, not even from the BRICS nations per se. It's not only Brazil, Russia, India, China, and South Africa. Egypt, as you mentioned. The Egyptian situation is quite astonishing. You have not only the building of this new Suez Canal, you have an open appeal from the government of Egypt to all of the unemployed in the country to please line up for jobs in this new Suez Canal. That certainly encourages optimism mm -hmm. in the youth. Uh, and you have the prospect of building a new form of energy, a jump in the energy platform to nuclear energy, uh, which the Egyptians have now adopted, and they're going to be building plants with the Russians on their Mediterranean coast and so on and so forth. But it's the sense of optimism, the sense of national pride, not simply based on the idea of, you know, like you might get in a jock mentality of, oh, I like my football team or something like that. It's not that. It's what Al-Sisi is talking about, that we as a nation can do this, and we can do this in the benefit of all of mankind, as he said very, very explicitly. So not surprisingly, when Al-Sisi comes to the United Nations to speak, at the same time, there's a demonstration of about 1,500 
Egyptians, Egyptian Americans, in the streets of New York in support of what he's saying. This is producing a mass outpouring of support. More remarkable still in that regard is what's happened in the case of India, which we'll be discussing a little bit few, for, few, uh, further ahead, because this week, as viewers of this program, I'm sure, are very well aware, India succeeded in a spectacular success of placing uh, MOM, the Mars Orbiter mission, in successfully in Mars orbit. And what that unleashed as well in India is, again, this sense of optimism can do and a belief in the powers, the unlimited powers of man's mind, every man's mind, be they Egyptians, be they Indians, be they Senegalese, be they Americans. And what you have in the case of, of the India situation in particular, this is, this is such an occasion of celebration of man's capability to do these things, that there are going to be very big demonstrations when Modi, the Prime Minister of India, speaks at the United Nations. I believe it's two days from now, um, or perhaps it's tomorrow. And he is then going to proceed to address a sellout crowd at Madison Square Garden, which seats about 20,000. Much better to go to hear Modi than to go to a boxing match, I would say, on numerous grounds. But that uh, presentation of Modi's is also going to be broadcast across the United States to meetings of Indian American communities and so on and so forth. And Modi's focus, and this is the key point which has been unleashed, which is what the British Empire so fears, is that power of man's mind to actually transform the world around him. And not just the immediate world, but the cosmos of which we are the active noetic part. So this is really what you see that's going on in this BRICS or BRICS plus process that's underway. You see it in the fearlessness of someone like Cristina Fernandez de Kirchner, who has been, in fact, quite a political leader in her own right, but standing up to Obama, who is, as you said, seated two seats away, looking like the crap had just been scared out of him by this woman who was you know, sticking her finger in his face, in point of fact, denouncing his policies all the way up and down the line. Because Argentina, too, has regained a sense of what they can accomplish. And not surprisingly, youth in, of Argentina, trained scientists, engineers, and so on, have begun to flock back to the country after decades of brain drain. They realize that the future lies not in being employed in NASA, because NASA ain't going nowhere under Obama, as we well know. Unless we get rid of Obama, NASA is grounded. And so that's the kind of thing you've got. Many scientists at NASA, it's been pointed out, are Indians. <laughs> well, they're going to be looking very seriously about who's going to be solving the breaking scientific problems of the future and how to address these things. So you've got this kind of explosion of optimism, which is based on an underlying concept of what man's mind is actually capable of achieving. And many of the people who are so mobilized may not even know that that's what's moving them, but it is. That is the underlying process of what's going on. You see it in a country like Bolivia, not a member of the BRICS, one of the poorest countries in all of South America. It's landlocked. George Soros and other drug legalizers thought they had that country in their hip pocket by promoting the idea that Bolivia is nothing but a coca-growing country and trying to induce them to become world leaders in the promotion of drug legalization. And now the government of Bolivia under Evo Morales has turned around on George Soros and said, forget it, we're going to outer space. And China has helped Bolivia launch a satellite, which the Bolivians are going to be using for, to bring international communications capabilities to Bolivia. They're also building rail projects. They're going to be industrializing iron ore. Uh, they'll be linking up their whole river systems with those of the rest of Ibero-America to bring about a project of integration of the countries of Ibero-America, which was dreamt of only going back to the 19th century with Alexander von Humboldt. These are obvious ideas of what man can do, but now they're becoming possible. And that's the kind of process which you see going on. In Argentina, I think what we have to say uh, at Executive Intelligence Review, back in June, even before the BRICS meeting, we had written and asked the question, will Argentina be the first country in the transatlantic sector, sector to jump ship from the transatlantic banking system and instead join with the emerging 
uh, Eurasian bloc, and in particular the BRICS? And I think we can now answer that question in the affirmative. That is, in fact, what Argentina has done. That is what many nations around the world are now doing. And this is the kind of process that's going on. This one is, leads one to recall Helga Zepp LaRouche's earlier demand of the nations of Europe that they have to choose sides on the Argentine question. Are they going to back Argentina's efforts to develop, or are they going to side with the vulture funds, who incidentally, as Cristina Fernandez de Kirchner herself said in her United Nations speech, it is the vulture funds that are creating poverty and looting and desperation and no future for the youth, which is the recruiting ground of terrorism. So if you want to deal with terrorism, start off by getting rid of the vulture funds. <laughs> at the same time you reveal the 28 pages. Those would both be very successful ways to, to, to deal with the terrorism question. So Helga Zeplerusch's question and demand of the uh, governments of Europe are, which side are you on on this thing? You have to pronounce yourselves. You have to come out and side with humanity, not the vulture funds. Now, unfortunately, it needs to be said that the German minister Schäuble uh, had some very nasty comments to make about Argentina and how they were being an unreliable country and so on and so forth. And so much so that the vulture funds quoted Schäuble at length in their latest full-page advertisement that they published in the Washington Post and the New York Times and so on, conveniently the same day that Cristina Fernandez de Kirchner addressed the United Nations. So this is something which not only the Argentines but others are taking due note of. So. These are the kinds of things that actually will change the world in a profound way. If you want to get rid of terrorism, if you want to have actual security, we've got to make a basic point. It is not the case that the shortest distance between two points is a straight line. It's not true in geometry. Euclid was wrong on that as well as just about everything else. It's not the case in politics. Because if you want to get rid of terrorism, the worst thing to do is to respond directly to the creation that the British Empire has put out there, and then you get a spreading war, which is the point that the Pope has made, that Christina Fernandez de Kirchner has made, and that Helga Zepp LaRouche has made repeatedly. You have to go at the underlying causes and roots of the problem. And what I would like to do is simply to read for people the concluding call in Helga Zepp LaRouche's most recent article where she issues a call for an emergency conference to establish a new security architecture globally. And she says, we immediately need a global emergency conference with only a single theme. How should a global inclusive security architecture be designed which guarantees the existence and security of all nations on the planet? Okay, that's the question posed. She says, President Xi Jinping of China has repeatedly argued that there can be no security structure that grants security only to a few states, while others remain in chaos and danger. Only an inclusive security architecture can guarantee world peace. And precisely such a security architecture, which encompasses all states, must urgently be placed on the agenda if we do not want to collectively kill ourselves off. And Mrs. Zeplerouche says, in conclusion, the obvious economic basis for such an inclusive security approach is the new Silk Road program, which China is working to bring about and whose spirit the aforementioned alliances have embraced. The Chinese government has repeatedly stressed that this new Silk Road is an open concept which every nation can join. The human species... Mrs. Zeplerus said, will survive only if we learn the lessons of the two world wars of the 20th century and stop thinking in geopolitical categories. We must replace this imperial oligarchical approach with a new paradigm that the common aims of mankind are the priority for everyone. This is also the view of the coincidence of opposites that Nicholas of Cusa put forward in the 15th century in his Coincidencia Oppositorum that this is the only way to achieve, quote, concordance in the macrocosm. Now we have arrived at the point, she concludes, where our survival as a species depends on achieving this level of thinking.
Well, directly in line with this theme of optimism you just presented, Dennis, I have a, um, as you mentioned, the Indians have successfully placed their Mars orbiter mission in orbit around Mars Tuesday night. And it's been noted that this is, this is a major success. This is a major success for India, first time they've done this. This is a major success for Asia, the first time Asia has sent an orbiter to Mars. And uh, it's been noted that only 40% of all the attempts to reach Mars have succeeded historically, 60% having failed. So this is a truly significant, truly noteworthy event. Um, I have here a statement of congratulations to the nation of India written by Keisha Rogers, which I'd like to read to our audience here. Uh, the following message was sent in by Keisha Rogers, former candidate and Democratic nominee for the 22nd Congressional District of Texas in 2010 and 2012, and former candidate for the U.S. Senate in 2014. She writes, greetings. I would like to use this opportunity to, to deliver an enthusiastic congratulations to the nation of India and India's space scientists for their successful delivery of the Mars Orbiter mission to Mars earlier this week. This is a success for India, it is a success for all of Asia, and it is a success for all of mankind. And I would like to, del to deliver a congratulations, but also a thank you to India on behalf of the United States for providing this opportunity for exploration for India and for mankind. Keisha continues, during my campaigns, I ran on the platform of impeaching Barack Obama and saving, uh, and saving our space program, NASA, from Obama's attempts to cut down and dismantle our spacefaring capabilities. I believe that the reversal or destruction of mankind's development of their ever-increasing spacefaring capabilities is a crime. It is not only a crime against those who might lose their jobs today. It is not only a crime against those who might lose their inspiration for the future today. It is a crime also against future generations whose existence and livelihood depend upon the growth and development of the human species. A growth and development which today means reaching out into space. In response to the successful arrival of Mars's new Mars mission, India's Prime Minister uh, Modi said, quote, The success of our space program is a shining symbol of what we are capable of as a nation. Let us push the boundaries and push and then push some more and then push more, end quote. I want the Prime Minister to know. I want the Indian space scientists to know. And I want all the Indian people to know that there are many of us in the United States that are behind you. Continue to push, continue to move forward, and continue to break new ground. Today, in this unique historical time, this is exactly what mankind needs. An orientation to the future. An orientation to developing the unknown. And a peaceful international alliance between nations to pursue and achieve these goals together. What India has achieved in this successful mission is not just a victory for India, but also for all mankind. You have continued to set the path toward reaching the common aims of mankind through achieving human discovery and exploration of our solar system, creating the conditions to live in peace back here on Earth. Remembering the words of President John F. Kennedy, as he once remarked, quote, we believe that when men reach beyond this planet, they should leave their national differences behind them. This vision of Kennedy and this vision of all those great leaders gone before who paved the way for all nations to come together in peace and harmony through advancements in scientific progress and in true economic prosperity for all people of the world may soon be realized. What India has done in collaboration with the BRICS allies in developing a new standard for peaceful 
and progressive international cooperation is a marker for what must come, a marker for what must become a new paradigm for the human species on this planet. And India's successful arrival at Mars this week typifies that direction. So for that, again, we congratulate you, but we also thank you. The thing that's so encouraging and exciting about occasions such as the successful Indian Mars mission, and perhaps like many of you, I had the good fortune of watching this while it was being streamed live at the moment of the success. And you saw on the faces of the scientists there gathered and Prime Minister Modi, who was there, uh, and had he had a little less self-control, he probably would have been biting his fingernails mm -hmm. while this was going on, but intently concentrating on what was going on at the moment of success, you saw an explosion of uh, joy, happiness, and uh, co mutual congratulations of the sort which we're all familiar with, those of us who have uh, witnessed this in the United States as well, when NASA was engaged in such successful activities. In fact, successful activities of that sort in the past produced the fact that just a day or two before the India's mom arrived in Mars orbit, uh, the U.S. Maven craft also went into Mars orbit. So we have a little bit of a traffic jam going on up there, but nothing could be better <laughs> uh, than that kind of a traffic jam. Um, but you also saw this kind of joyous happiness at the capabilities of man's scientific capabilities uh, in the expressions of the Argentines as well when they recently succeeded in a test launch of their Tronador rocket um, from a very modest uh, trailer that was on the site of the launch and so on. But it gets at what this underlying issue is of what, what the success is uh, and what the underlying issue uh, behind the Indian developments are, which I had the opportunity to discuss with Mr. LaRouche earlier in the week, the day that it actually happened. Before going to his remarks on that, I do want to first just contrast this to the not only the, the bestialism of what we see in ISIS, but far more important than that, the bestialism of those who have intentionally created ISIS. That outlook, that outlook of the British Empire, that environmentalist green outlook, which one sees in, for example, the attempts at the United Nations two days before the United Nations GA to hold a global conference on global warming and uh, so on and so forth and all the green agenda, which incidentally Indian Prime Minister Modi was too busy watching the successful Mars launch to bother attending, and the Chinese didn't go either. So there you got 30% of the planet was not interested in listening to Al Gore, and I would certainly congratulate them on that as well. Um, but you have the activities of, the, of Prince Charles, Prince Philip, and so on, actively promoting their genocidal Nazi policies that man is like a virus and should be destroyed, and the fewer the better actively promoting the contrary idea that the every time a child is born, that's a tragedy. Promoting the idea that man is nothing but a wasted expression on the planet and the fewer the better. And thus the British Empire's stated policy of reducing the population of the planet from seven billion down to one or less. And never forget that that's what the economic, the underlying issue of the economic crisis is. This is what is behind the Obama question. This is what is behind the drive for a dictatorship that Mr. LaRouche is denouncing. This is the policy that we're fighting against with a completely contrary view of what man actually is. So when you see expressions of that outlook of the British queen in these ISIS brainwashed terrorists beheading people, on television or on the meet on videos, you get an idea of what the actual battle lines are. It's of some note that earlier today we got a report 
that a group of 126 Sunni Muslim scholars have written an open letter to the putative head of ISIS, Abu Bakr al-Baghdadi, in which they rake him over the coals in all regards, from a theological standpoint, uh, from a political standpoint, from the standpoint of the bestiality, they simply say this is not what Islam actually is. And what he is doing has nothing to do with Islam. They say the idea of announcing a caliphate without any consensus is sedition, according uh, to mus actual Muslim doctrine. You cannot simply declare Muslims that you don't like to be non-Muslims and then proceed to kill them, they say. And they uh, actually issue a, a call, which is now circulating internationally, which includes a 24-point executive summary, which details all of the theological errors that the uh, IS leaders have engaged in um, and so forth. They say, you have killed many innocents who were neither combatants nor armed just because they disagree with your opinion. There is no such thing as offensive, aggressive jihad just because people have different religions or opinions. And they say the Quran also forbids killing diplomats, emissaries, journalists, and especially any people of the scriptures, including Christians and Muslims who disagree with ISIS. So you can, you can see the issue, the way the lines are being drawn on this thing. At the same time this week, representing this idea of the community of interest, the dialogue of civilizations that's required to get out of this crisis, the Chinese president, uh, Xi Jinping, speaking at a conference uh, on the celebration of Confucius and the 2,565th anniversary of his birth, Xi Jinping stated that culture is the soul of a nation, countries must value and maintain their own thinking and culture while recognizing and respecting others. He said, all countries and nations should learn and draw on the strength and quintessence of others' ideology and culture. This is an important condition to encourage dignity, confidence, and strength of native ideology and culture. Any kind of civilization, he said, no matter which country or nation it originated from, is fluid and open. <clears throat> and I can only concur with Helga Zeplerush's remark earlier when she heard these remarks to say, well, those are the founding principles of the Schiller Institute, which she founded uh, many decades ago, 30 plus in point of fact, exactly this idea of the dialogue of civilizations in search of the common aims of mankind, which are premised on a concept of man, which is the exact antithesis of everything that the British Empire represents. Now, what is that concept of man? And this is the point that Mr. LaRouche underscored <clears throat> in a discussion that we had earlier in the week around the Indian developments. <clears throat> Excuse me. And what he said is, look, the, the real lesson that we have to learn, and it's a lesson which is crucial for our political tasks before us, is that the system that we're looking at, which is a system of man's relationship to the entirety of the cosmos, not just the planet Earth, not just his own economy, but the solar system and beyond. That system, Mr. LaRouche said, is a self-defining developing system. It has no fixed principle in it. It has no fixed metric. There is no rule that applies now and forever. Why? Well, the answer to that, he said, takes us back to what Johannes Kepler and Nicholas of Cusa in particular brought to Western civilization in the creation of the Golden Renaissance, and Cusa was the founding genius, in fact, of that Renaissance, which is the idea that man, as a creative noetic being, that is to say, he has the, the demonstrated capability of discovering and developing new universal principles which, when applied, actually increase man's mastery over every aspect of the cosmos that he is in touch with, which now includes Mars. We're directly in touch with Mars. Mm -hmm. And that man's creativity in relationship to this cosmos system means, according to Cusa, that there is no way you can measure anything in that system with a metric anything inferior 
to the creative process of man's mind itself. Kuza summarizes this in a simple concept, uh, but it's very profound, which is that man's mind is the metric of the universe. Because man's mind is actually measuring its own creative impact on the cosmos around it. Kruza broadens the concept to say that no merely finite thing can measure something which is relatively infinite, contrary to everything that imbecile, that evil imbecile Aristotle taught, which is that you reach a measurement of the infinite with all these tiny little pieces. You just get smaller and smaller pieces. You know, you get a sharp knife, you chop the sausage down as much as you can, you get to the ultimate particle, and then you can add it all together, and that gives you your line. And then you add lines together, that gives you a surface. You add surfaces, you get spa all nonsense, Kuza says. You measure the uh, finite with the infinite, not the other way around, meaning man's mind is the only metric of the universe. And Mr. LaRouche's point on this thing is that's what we're dealing with here today. And he said this is a concept which China and its scientific leadership understands. And it's a feature of China that very few people actually get and understand. But they do understand that this is, in fact, what the issue is. It, however, is a universal concept, Mr. LaRouche said. It's accessible to all of mankind. And it is our task, it is our task to make that concept clear and accessible to all of humanity. Because the clarity that we need to have on that concept is what is required to actually transform the current strategic situation. We're in a period where one system is dying and threatens to bring the entire planet down with it, the British Empire. <clears throat> a new system is coming into being. It's being built. But it must be constructed on the principles and with an understanding that it is a system which is self-defining, where man's creative activity is the metric which is not a metric of that entire system, and that the source of the energy of the power of that system comes from man's creativity. Now, this is something which has been shown and which is the driving political force that is now governing what, governing what we were discussing in Egypt, in Argentina, in Bolivia, in India, in China, in Russia, in more than half of humanity. They may not put it in those words. They may have different ways of expressing it. The ideas of Confucius went at the same concepts from a different angle. But those are the ideas which the LaRouche movement uniquely expresses and has developed, which is the key to saving humanity from a fate worse than death, which is being governed by the British Queen and Obama. Let's put an end to that and get on with the business of mankind. With that, I would like to uh, thank Dennis for joining us tonight and thank Ben. Uh, and I would like to thank you for tuning in. And I'm going to bring a conclusion to tonight's broadcast. Please stay tuned to LaRouchePack.com. Good night. <laughs>